Welcome everyone uh, to this uh, event today, which is uh, related to uh, Ask the Expert topic presented to you by OCD Wisconsin in, uh, in partnership with the A.V. Corker Foundation. Now, uh, there is about 94 of you that have signed up, uh, but I see more and more people logging in. So I'm going to allow a few minutes for for us before we get started until you know more people sign up. Good evening. My name is Adel Corker, and uh, and I welcome you and and all the participants to tonight's Ask the Expert panel discussion and screening of the unfor of, the, of of a wonderful film, unforgettable film called Unstuck, an OCD kids movie. I am a member of the OCD Wisconsin Board of Directors. And my foundation is proud to be a partner in tonight's event. Uh, this is, as you all know, an OCD Awareness Week, the OCD Awareness Week. And OCD Wisconsin recognizes the many efforts to provide education, support, and hope for those affected by obsessive compulsive disorder. Working to end the stigma around mental health and promote understanding of the realities of the diagnosis, treatment, and successful recovery of those with OCD is our very important mission. I think you will all see through the eyes of the inspiring youth in this film, the struggle and potential successes, successes uh, uh, that are possible. Uh, one thing I would like to mention to you from a housekeeping standpoint is that uh, uh, if you have any question, please, on your right hand screen, you'll see a chat uh, and, and you can go ahead and use that chat room to provide any questions or comment that you may have. Well, let's get started with the movie. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this. I've seen this movie uh, several times, and every time I see it, it, it touches me. And and uh, what a what a brave uh, bunch of kids, and 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 provide me with hope. Uh, I'm sure to all of you uh, that that uh, success and prevail is positive uh, in the face of OCD. Well, tonight we have really the great pleasure of facilitating an open dialogue with experts with lived as well as clinical experience. Uh, and uh, so, uh, like I indicated, uh, for any questions, please use the chat uh, here. Uh, we have uh, uh, three uh, uh, clinical experts and two individuals with lived experience. Uh, so, uh, my my plan really is at this point to introduce uh, those who who are going to be our expert, uh, Brenda Bailey. Uh, she is a psychologist at uh, Rogers Behavioral Health. Elizabeth Erickson, who is a licensed uh, licensed practitioner um, uh, at the, at the, uh, 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 Rogers Behavioral Health as well. Uh, uh, Dr. N Nicholas Farrell. Uh, you can turn your camera on and say hi. Uh, he's a psychologist at, uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, Rogers Behavioral Health. And then uh, we have Brooke Miller, who had lived with OCD. You can say hello to us. Hey. And then we have Annie Welsh. And uh, here she goes. Hello, Annie. Okay. All right. Well, uh, since we can only have uh, 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 three individuals on the screen at once, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the questions as they come through, and then we'll direct them to any of the experts or the uh, lived experience individuals. Um, well, I think that while, while questions are really coming across, I'm going to really start a uh, by asking a question to to uh, 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 Brooke, uh, Brooke, you know, having watched this movie, um, you know, and and not sure how old were you when you first 
uh, suffered from from this disorder. And and what was your what was your uh, course of life through it was? Can you give can you share that with us? Sure. Um, so first of all, just want to introduce myself. I'm Brooke. Um, I bring lived experience. I've had OCD, started showing symptoms around the age of eight. I'm now 34. Um, and I also have a seven-year-old son um, that also has OCD. Um, I currently also sit on the board of directors for OCD Wisconsin, which is helping to um, put this event on. So in regards to Adel's question, um, I had an experience where I started showing symptoms when I was about eight, but I figured that all out when I was well into my 20s. Um, I really didn't understand what was happening to me. It was passed off a lot um, as a child by school teachers and my parents as just being a perfectionist. Um, and that's just the way she is and things that she does. Um, when I got into my mid to late 20s, that's when I started to really question and wonder what exactly it was that I was dealing with. Um, I'd seen several different therapists that didn't really know how to treat me. Um, all they really wanted to do was just kind of talk things through, which really wasn't helping me. Um, I finally, after going through five therapists that weren't able to help, I reached out to the outreach program at Rogers and just said, you know, what therapists are actually trained in OCD and um, can actually help me because I've been through a lot and haven't been able to find anybody. And they were able to connect me with a local provider who's very familiar and has um, a long past in treating OCD, which was definitely the turnaround for me. Awesome. Uh, uh, thank you. You know, as I as I will watch the movie and 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 watch the the experiences that each of the kids have, uh, and as as I listen to you, Brooke, I, I I realize that you know there's a lot of challenges associated with the diagnosis of OCD, and uh, it looks it took a while for you to find out what you have and get the treatment that you need. I'd like to direct a question to Dr. Farrell. Uh, you know, is this really common in OCD? And, and why is it that it's such a challenge to really uh, come up with a diagnosis? OCD can be challenging because a lot of times the individuals that are experiencing the symptoms themselves uh, aren't, aren't really aware that there's symptoms to begin with. Um, they, they know that there's a problem. They often know that something's not right and that, you know, what what their experience like isn't normal, um, and yet they they oftentimes struggle to kind of put fit words uh, and understanding to the experiences that they're having. Um, if, if you're like me, you didn't hear about obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, beyond maybe a little bit of media exposure uh, until college years. And so I'm, I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of one of these kids. Um, and this is often what we see with our young patients at Rogers that you know, when, when they talk about their first experience with the disorder, you know, they, they felt very alienated. They could tell that, you know, something was going on that was, um, you know, made them distinct from, from their classmates. And yet again, they couldn't find the words or necessarily the descriptions to be able to kind of make sense and bring a, bring, um, a solid understanding to what they were experiencing. Um, and I think the, the problem with diagnosis is compounded by the fact that you know, we're, we're just not that aware as as a medical and, and behavioral health community about what OCD really is. Um, that, that sounds pretty shocking, but, you know, unfortunately, um, we know that the vast majority of individuals who experience obsessive compulsive disorder are unable to, you know, access uh, professionals that can provide an accurate diagnosis and that can provide evidence-based treatment. Um, it's really one of the reasons why we have um, you know awareness events like this trying to you know, really kind of get the word out and help people understand a little bit more about OCD. Um, if we can just reach you know a, a few families tonight, I think this will be very successful. That's awesome. You know, uh, I'd like to have another question to 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 um, to Brenda. Uh, uh, Brenda, uh, you see a lot of patients with OCD, and you 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 talk to them. And you know, someone someone like me, for example, uh, you know, I'm seven, seven eight, eight, nine, ten years, years old, old, and I just I wash my hands, hands too many times. I'm a little obsessed about you know. And then my mother would look at me. She said, "Don't be an OCD," you know. 
And and then she would just throw that at me as if like, oh, it's just it's one of those things. But where is that line between a disease and just being, you know, too obsessed about certain things, you know, whether it's your homework or whether it's your hand washing or washing your hair. Where is that? Where is that? You know, that gray line between what is pathologic and what is just normal that we experience? Yeah, there's not. It's hard because there really isn't a line. Um, you know, it's dimensional. It can be it can be very, very severe for some and then kind of low levels for others. Um, the DSM would say <laughs> they kind of put a time limit on it and say if it's over an hour a day that you're spending on this, then it's part of the diagnosis. Um, but that's really kind of arbitrary. Um, for me, I lean on the criteria that's significant distress or impairment um, or, you know, endured with great distress. So maybe you're not avoiding, but you're in situations, but you're really, really um, having a lot of distress in those situations and very, very anxious, you can still qualify for the diagnosis. Um, but yeah, for me, it's, it's whether the person is really struggling with it, um, then I'm, more likely to, you know, have that conversation of this is, you know, a diagnosis that can be treated. Hmm. Thank you. We have a question. Well, we'll keep you on. We'll keep you on the screen here. We have a question from uh, someone about exposure therapy and how does it really work? I mean, is it uh, really rewiring your brain and how is it doing that? <laughs> yeah. Um, I like to tell people that you're teaching your brain something different. Um, I don't know if we're completely rewiring it, but we're at least putting in competing information into your brain. Um, so if you are, you know, engaging in compulsions, you're kind of teaching yourself, your brain is learning that you need those compulsions in order to function. You need that compulsion in order for your anxiety to go down. And with exposure therapy, we're kind of giving your brain new information and we're allowing it to learn that you don't need that behavior in order to function. You don't need that behavior in order for you to be able to tolerate anxiety. Um, and so for me, it's just about giving your brain more information than what it's constantly getting um, through rituals is that you need that ritual in order to survive or function. Yeah, awesome. Uh, thank you. We actually for um i think dr farrell is going to say something oh, yeah. okay, i just, I just wanted to I'm chime sorry, in right. um <clears throat> yeah no no worries so one of the interesting things the, the the treatment that you saw these kids describe in the film uh is the most evidence-based treatment for ocd it's known as exposure and response prevention therapy also known as erp or sometimes right. just called exposure therapy for short um and what you saw right. that it requires um, an individual to do is to confront the types of scenarios and people and places and things that evoke, you know, that strong anxiety and fear response, um, but then not ha you know, engage in the typical behavior um, that the person would use to try to suppress their anxiety or make it go away. Um, so one, one young man, the one who was concerned about, um, you know, kind of the bodybuilding and Hulk type things, um, you, you saw him have to uh, exhale, breathe out for a really long period of time. So an exposure uh, activity for him might be to confront, you know, like a photograph like he did and then not use that exhaling behavior. And what, what Dr. Bailey describes is it's, it's giving the, the person new information that prior to treatment, they're not typically taking in. And they're not taking it in because they're continually relying on that kind of safety response or that compulsive behavior. Again, in the young man's example, it was exhaling. Now, the question here is about what's happening on a brain level. And the funny thing is we don't know. Uh, we, we don't know precisely that the science is not really advanced enough for us to say when someone undergoes a successful course of exposure therapy, here's exactly what happens in the brain. We don't know that yet. One of the things we do know is that when, when people take medications, and they are effective in treating OCD. And we do kind of pre versus post treatment brain scans and we see changes in how the brain is structured and how it functions. We see very similar changes when one undergoes this exposure and response prevention therapy. So I'm, I'm sharing that with everyone tonight 
so that can I say with certainty that the brain is rewired? No, no, no one can say that. But we can say that there are, you know, detectable structural and functional changes in the brain that we can see associated with a successful course of exposure therapy. Right. Now that I have both of you on, why don't you why don't you come back on the screen, uh, uh, Nickel, Nickel, Nick? Well, you know, now that we're sharing this, is that to to what extent? The individuals that that have gone through the rewiring now they are they went through therapy and they're and they are being treated and, and they're and they're doing okay now this is all done through all the treatments that they have received of which they received the exposure and the response and they build that slowly until they got to the point where they can go ahead with their own life now what is the risk of this relapsing when the treatments or you know is that something that they need to continue on all the way into adulthood. Yeah, um, we do do a lot of planning for that. Um, it is sort of like a new mindset that you've gained once you go through um, successful ERP, that it's kind of something you need to keep approaching. And one of the children in the story did say that, that there's times where he'll kind of catch himself, like, oh, if I do this, it could really turn into something and I don't wanna go back there. So we kind of take the approach of like, well, how can you challenge yourself when those thoughts do come back? Where, what are some things you can try? Um, and so it is sort of like a mindset that you adopt that you carry with you throughout your life um, because you do have a little bit of that tendency to kind of fall back on rituals when you're experiencing anxiety or when you, you know, have developed kind of a newer sub obsession. I see, I see. Well, uh, in light of the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, Next, you say, you know, one of the, the main messages that Dr. Bailey and I try to impress on patients at Rogers is that this, this highly effective treatment exposure and response prevention um, is obviously you know, effective in a short term. That's, that's how it's often studied in, in um, you know, clinical trials. We give folks 12 sessions over the course of 12 weeks and we measure their OCD severity at pre and post treatment. Um, What's, what's great though is when we follow people over a longer course of time, we see that those folks that receive exposure and response prevention therapy on average tend to maintain their gains very well. Um, so it's a treatment that is associated with very good durability. Now, I of course can't say that the risk of relapse is zero, um, that you know, re relapse is always a consideration, um, but where one of the things where exposure and response prevention therapy comes in so key is essentially the person becomes their own therapist. And I think you saw that in the kids in this film. I mean, they, they articulate treatment mm -hmm. rationale better than many seasoned clinicians can, dare I say. And I, I, I think that that um, really emphasizes the importance of the individual that's receiving the treatment themselves, developing an understanding, and they know how then to apply it when symptoms should reemerge, you know, maybe later in time. And it's not yeah. uncommon for someone with OCD to um, experience a change in their symptom kind of subtype. So they might, you know, say like, oh, back when I was 20, I used to be obsessed with contamination and I would wash my hands and have cleaning rituals. And now I check and I have doubt over whether or not I've performed tasks adequately. So if we can teach them to be their own therapist, like Dr. Farrell said, mm -hmm. when they experience that emergence of a new symptom, still OCD, but a different kind of phenotype, um, they'll be able to address it. That's awesome. Yeah, that 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 it really makes a lot of sense. Um, well, we have a question uh, here from um, uh, one of the audience regarding the genetic uh, predisposition for OCD. In light of the uh, the comments uh, that uh, Brooke has made uh, about her son, I believe uh, you know you know Dr. Dr. Mil Dr. Farrell Nick. What are your what what are your what are your response to this question? Um, it, you know, from birth, be genetically predisposed to develop OCD. However, it's not as simple as saying it's a genetically based condition. Um, what, what, what I'm trying to say is. Um, there's, we have not been able to isolate an OCD gene, and I, I don't think that day is coming for a long time. Uh, the reason for that is because whereas genes can predispose one to develop OCD, it has to interact with the environment on some level. 
a, a phrase we we sometimes use in our field is that the the genes load the gun but the environment pulls the trigger this gets at the idea that yes one can develop kind of a, a tendency a predisposition if you will uh to develop ocd but it's not a certainty based solely on genetics that one will then go on to develop ocd there have to be you know um environmental experiences um oftentimes early in life that kind of interact with one's genetic predisposition to um you know really kind of unfortunately lead someone on a path to developing full-blown ocd another question i have and i'll let you guys decide who wants to take it uh has to deal with um, the fact that um and i've heard that before that sometimes strep infection can actually uh you know either exaggerate uh, or sometimes bring on the OCD. Uh, can can any of our experts here comment on that? Uh, streptococcal infections in youth in the development of OCD. It's actually a, a condition that has a technical term known as PANDAS, P-A-N-D-A-S, uh, I'm not even going to begin to um, try to recite the acronym. It's very long. Uh, but the the idea is the strep infection can attack uh, the areas of the brain that are known to be implicated in OCD. And what you see, it's it's um, almost entirely uh, in youth, is when you know, uh, a kid develops uh, a strep infection, rather than a, a slow kind of gradual onset of the OCD, it's very rapid. It's almost this kind of overnight thing where the kid wakes up the next morning with kind of full-blown OCD symptoms. And that's that's often one of the ways um, how clinicians diagnose PANDAS based on this kind of rapid onset of the symptoms. Well, this is Brooke. I just want to add to that. Um, so in regards to my seven-year-old, he actually was starting to show um, kind of minor or slight OCD type symptoms when he was probably about four or five. However, I was aware and almost cautious that I was being too hyper alert because it's something that I'm very familiar with. Um, however, he did, um, when he was six, have strep and get diagnosed. And we noticed a pretty significant, as Nick had just um, explained, that we noticed a significant uptick in a lot of his OCD behaviors, as well as kind of newly developed intrusive thoughts and compulsions um, with that. So he was given the diagnosis of PANDAS. Um, so that's been my experience with that. And we have noticed that as we've gotten farther from, we pretty much just really increased um, our exposure response therapy with him and his meetings with his therapist. And we've noticed as we've gotten farther from the event of him having strep, it's slowly and progressively gotten better. Um, and I would say that we're pretty much back at baseline now, um, but we continue to see the therapist and do exposure response um, therapy because it's really important um, to continue to get him in the right direction. Well, I want to have you back on, Brooke. Uh, and let me let me have Annie join us also. Uh, uh, Annie? Uh, this is a question that is directed to both of you. Uh, basically, Zeal, what could family and friends have done when you were younger to help and support you? And what can they do now that, uh, that you're an adult? Curious uh, what their input or support looks like uh, at different stages. Um, so I can kind of kick it off. I just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Annie Welsh, and I'm coming today with kind of two lenses here. One is someone who has obsessive compulsive disorder, and I don't remember a time when I didn't have symptoms of it. I didn't have a formal diagnosis until I was in high school, but my family was familiar with it, and I, I knew these things for a long time before that. Um, but I also come in with a lens of a high school teacher who works with a variety of students, including students with OCD. So I can talk a little bit about the supports I had and supports I try to provide for students as well. Um, so first, I'm very fortunate because I had support. I had family who understood what OCD was, what symptoms looked like. Um, and it's kind of hard, to, uh, or it was hard for me as a kid to understand how much support I had because mental illness is really, really selfish. It allows you to get so far in your head that you have no idea the sacrifices that people are making for you every day. 
Um, knowing that though, enabling is so easy. Um, as you saw in the film today, um, the young man who is really preoccupied with bodybuilders, his sister comes on camera and talks about how their family couldn't go to certain places because that might be a triggering place or an activity would be triggering for him and those compulsions would go, but that doesn't make it easier. And so even though, you know, it's, it, I can't imagine seeing a child in distress and knowing how triggering these things are, we're actually um, enabling and almost perpetuating some of these obsessions and compulsions by allowing uh, kids to avoid them. Um, I would say approach these situations. I was very lucky that I was approached with compassion, but even today, I know there's people in my life um, who can be very, I, it can be frustrating to be around me when I'm having those times. Um, but understanding, you know, presuming positive intent, nobody wants to be performing compulsions. Nobody wants to be having panicking moments. So coming from that lens of love, but then also, you know, that bit of tough love we have here. Um, the best line I've heard to describe it is that um, your diagnosis is an explanation, but it's not an excuse. So understanding that this may be why I'm doing a certain thing, but it doesn't mean that these behaviors are okay or that we should tiptoe around me in certain instances. So that's kind of the lens I try to take toward um, students with both obsessive compulsive disorder and anxiety in general. Um, it's actually kind of nice because it's like I'm giving, or I've been given the opportunity to now give to my son what I think I wish I would have had. Um, as a younger child. I do think that there's been forward progress in movement in regards to decreasing stigma around mental illness as a whole. However, I think we're still very far from where we could be. Um, one thing that I like to talk a lot about when I talk about this is that, you know, for somebody who has a physical medical illness, such as diabetes per se, there are easier um, access and opportunities to go into a doctor's office and say, you know, I have diabetes or these are the symptoms I'm experiencing um, and they're easy to or it's more simple to diagnose and they pretty much hand out a treatment plan to you and are able to provide the different medications and therapies etc that are needed um, with mental illness specifically OCD I think that um, that's much more difficult and there's a lot more barriers to getting to that point um, one thing that I think did potentially hurt me in the long run is that um, it was passed off for so many years that that's just the way that I was. Um, and I think that it's shown that I've just had to put in that much extra time and years into my own therapy and treatment um, to get better just because there's so much to delve into and it runs so deep. Um, my son trying to kind of acknowledge that, get him the right resources right away. Um, I'm hoping we'll make it so that he doesn't have as intense or as long of therapy as I've needed. Um, so that's been my experience with that. And I just wanted to um, add to that as well. When you talked about, you know, that's just the way they are. I hear that so often. And a lot of it um, is kind of strange with OCD because the compulsions that young children or adults, you know, whomever are, are performing, a lot of them aren't air quote, you know, bad things. Okay. A, a child wanting to clean up their toys, a child wanting to wash their hands, a child who prays, a child who apologizes, says, thank you. I'm sorry. Like these are all behaviors we try to teach our kids. So it seems wild that we're saying my kid does these things and I think that's wrong. And so just parents kind of recognizing or teachers or other, you know, caretakers, understanding that it's not the action, it's the reason for the action. Um, it's great that you're picking up your toys, but if you're picking up your toys because you think if someone else does it, they could be getting hurt, then all of a sudden we kind of get into that and start to notice some of those um, kind of warning signs. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Annie. Um, I definitely had experience, a lot of experience with perfectionism as a child. And unfortunately, when people, whether it be my family or friends or teachers that I work with, would turn around and say, you know, she's the best student in the class or, um, you know, give me extra tasks or responsibilities that they may not give others, that in, in, in the end ended up being just a lot of reassurance. Um, which continued to drive and increase my OCD and um, it specifically my perfectionism. Mm -hmm. um, as I'm listening to uh, 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 to both of you speak, I, I'm reminded by uh, studies that I've came across related to enabling. Uh, and then the world of parents uh, have or siblings in enabling individuals was 
uh, OCD and how it could actually negatively impact uh, their treatment and their outcome of their treatment. I wonder if I could have Dr. Elizabeth Erickson pop in and then and share her thoughts on that. We call that family accommodation or accommodation where, um, again, well intended to try to help alleviate um, the distress that a loved one might be experiencing. Um, what we find is that actually it prevents the individual from um, learning that their fear might either be overestimated or um, that they're in turn underestimating their ability to, to cope um, without engaging in the ritual. So if you remember when um, Dr. Um, Farrell and Dr. Bailey were talking about um, kind of retraining or um, your brain learning something new um, by um, engaging in or accommodating by telling someone it's okay, it's fine, um, doing something for them. Um, that prevents the individual from actually encountering their fear um, without the um, compulsion or the response that eliminates or temporary relieves. Um, and in the long run, it actually perpetuates. Um, when that happens, sometimes too, um, the indi individual learns to rely on or need um, those responses in order to feel safe. Um, and as they encounter new situations, it might start to compile. So um, one of the kids was talking about how, um, you know, in the beginning it was maybe washing just, um, you know, a little less frequent. And as time went on, um, things really expanded or with the tree where um, it really got to a point where um, all trees, any trees. And so that's what we find is that um, the fears do perpetuate in, um, in that way. Um, it can be unhelpful. And so um, one tip is to, to help and support your loved one by, in theory, not helping. Now that I actually have you, uh, the, can you come back? Well, it's all right. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll thank you, Brenda. Uh, <laughs> you don't want me over, Elizabeth. Uh, no, no, I, I need both of you. I need both of you. This is, a big, this is an important question. Mm -hmm. now, now, how do you differentiate between OCD uh, obsession and a distinct disorder? For example, obsessions around food versus a separate eating disorder or obsessions around friendship versus social anxiety disorder? So I think Dr. Farrell was gonna field this one. It's it's a little bit more in his wheelhouse with uh, eating disorders. Right, well, we can we can have him pop in, you know. Yeah. All right. I'm happy to, but I I think he has some good. All right, we'll let him do that. <laughs> um, where it was the the difference between OCD and then more of a distinct or focused obsession. You know, for example, is it OCD or uh, something else when one's you know, obsessions and anxiety are strictly focused on one's friendships or something like that. Um, what we find often is a differentiating factor is that OCD tends to be a condition where there's actually multiple symptom kind of domains or areas that are present and co-occurring at the same time. So you, you saw some different presentations. The, the first young lady that we heard from tonight explained her fears about illness and poison. Uh, the, the next young lady talked about fears of being responsible for harm coming to family members. Then there was the young gentleman with the fear of clocks and how that could cause bad things to happen. So fears that are distinct from one another, but what's actually more common in OCD is rather than there just being one specific fear domain that bothers a person, it's multiple, you know, kind of fear domains. So there's multiple obsessional thoughts or images that bother the person and then multiple kind of compulsive safety behaviors that the person feels compelled to engage in. So that's that's often what um, kind of distinguishes OCD from more of an exclusive focus, say like in social anxiety, where one is concerned about the quality of their friendships. And then somebody asked a related question about the distinction between OCD and eating disorders. And that's a very interesting distinction. If you get me going, I'm gonna spend the rest of the night talking about this, but I'm gonna try to be very brief. Um, they're, they're very similar. Uh, more similar than I think we realize. Um, if if we think about eating disorders almost through the lens of OCD, we can think about eating disorders as involving obsessions around, you know, uh, one's eating habits, obsessions around one's weight and physique and things like that. And then there's also compulsive behaviors in eating disorders, just like there are in OCD, whether it's compulsive 
uh, exercising, withholding certain foods from oneself. So there's certainly some similarities. Um, there are also some things that make them distinct from one another. Uh, one of the most central features of eating disorders tend to be when a person becomes very, um, w w when they, they tend to do what we call overvalue um, the weight or shape as being kind of the most central features of who they are and how other people think about them. Um, there's, of course, uh, a host of different medical, really severe medical consequences that are associated with eating disorders um, that make it somewhat distinct from OCD. But they are very similar to one another. Um, clinically, we think about them in a very similar way. Uh, we do what's called conceptualize them in a similar way, which means to um, think about how they're maintained and why they don't go away. Um, and then not surprisingly, we actually treat them in a very similar fashion. The, mm -hmm. the, the most evidence-based treatment of choice for eating disorders follow, follows very closely with the type of treatment that you saw portrayed in the film tonight, the exposure and response prevention piece. It's a fa fascinating question. That is really, really fascinating and very interesting. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to uh, extend the question to um, our expert um, in reference to the anger that some of the children's demonstrated uh, when they when they were so afraid or so obsessed about the situation that they were in and they got mad at their parents and and angry at them and and uh, you know how often do you see that as part of the manifestations of the behaviors among uh, 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 among kids with a kids with or adults with OCD that that can actually be common, um, especially when loved ones start to try to not accommodate. Mm -hmm. We call um, any time that we um, kind of change a behavior that someone was either um, counting on, especially knowing that it was alleviating that anxiety or that fear, um, there's kind of an adjustment, right? And so um, the term that we use is extinction burst when um, if you think about it, kind of this pressure of the fear and anxiety kind of just builds up. And so um, sometimes what we see then is just just high distress, um, remembering that these fears are believed. And so the individual may think that, gosh, mom, if you don't, you know, um, wash your hands too and wear gloves to prepare my meal, um, I'm going to get really sick or whatever that fear is. Um, and so um, in response to that, anger um, definitely can follow um, and or another learned behavior by being angry. Perhaps I see my loved one then give in or, or then accommodate to appease um, and again alleviate um, what might otherwise be a very uncomfortable experience. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Bailey? Too. Yeah, um, help with some of the anger that can come up because it is common. Um, we try to have discussions about how we're going to reduce accommodations versus cold turkey. Um, you know, just completely wiping out any sort of accommodation can be really hard. Um, so we go through how we're going to go about that. We can discuss ways to talk about um, rituals, so seeking reassurance is a really common um, ritual. So if a person's coming to you and asking the same question over and over, rather than saying like, you're seeking reassurance, stop doing that, we can say like, hey, I, I hear you asking me that question again. Are you feeling anxious? Do you think you could at least wait 10 minutes and see where you're at? Um, it takes more time. <laughs> it's, it's a lot easier and less time consuming to say stop. Uh, but in order for the person to maybe not escalate to the point where they're getting really angry and sort of kind of forcing someone into accommodating, we can have um, discussions about how to be supportive of someone challenging OCD versus supporting OCD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any, any additional comment that you have, uh, Elizabeth? I was just going to add to that. Um, Sometimes it can be helpful um, in those discussions with families and the patient to um, come up with what I call just a pocket statement, whether that be a word or just a concise phrase that both the um, individual struggling and the family member have um, kind of talked through and agreed on. So that way 
when um, trying not to accommodate, you can use that term um, and the individual knows what they're hearing and what the um, loved one is saying. Um, and having that discussed when um, someone isn't already highly anxious or elevated can be beneficial when um, a situation that provokes anxiety comes around. Cool. You know, I want to bring back uh, uh, both uh, Brooke and Annie onto the screen. Uh, you know, the question really is, is really interesting is coming from an individual who suffered from OCD since she was uh, 10 years old and she's now 36 years old and she's still being challenged by it. And, uh, you know, what, what is what a message that you have for someone like that? Someone who actually is living with the disease, living with the experience, and and uh, and I'm not certain whether this individual is actually. Um, is she she says she hadn't seen this doc yet, so she hasn't seen a physician yet. I'm I'm assuming that she was diagnosed, but uh, she has not seen a physician. Uh, but you know, looking at the two of you, I mean, you you've done a great. I mean, you've, you've really navigated the disease and you've overcome and here you are standing as a panelist discussing this. You know, what message do you have for people who are still still struggling out there? Um, first, I would just say like all mental illnesses is that they look different on different people and on different days. Um, so this isn't really like a, a survivor story, more like a, we're, in the, we're in our journeys too. I would say this last year, um, I'm very grateful that my OCD is not contamination based, um, but it is very, I, I do rely on structure and routines that have been very disrupted in the last year and caused a lot of things that I thought weren't problems anymore to kind of re-arise. And so acknowledging that uh, it is a journey and it does, it is a lot of work. Um, I would say, you know, what you're seeing is valid. I would say the work necessary to address a lot of this stuff is absolutely worth it, even though it's not fun at all. Um, but I would also just say, you know, keep trucking just like, you know, anyone else, but just acknowledging the fact that, you know, we're here today talking and giving our opinions and, you know, we've been through different treatments, but it's absolutely, you know, it's not something you're cured from. It's something you learn to live with and learn how to manage. And so that to me, um, treatment, treatment has been so worth it there. But I, I never want to come off that, like, you know, <laughs> glad that's over because it, it is a decision every day um, to live with and kind of work hard every day for this. I see, I see that. Uh. Um, I couldn't agree more with what Annie just said. Um, I think for a long time I actually struggled in my own treatment because that's exactly what I was looking for, is I was looking for the absolute, the finality of it, for me to be able to walk out of a building and say, yay, I don't have OCD anymore, I get to live my life. Um, and I've come to realize that's not how it works. Um, but I do think that with having me and Annie here, a big thing that we're here to do is really to just um, show that there's hope for the ability to live better lives. Um, and to enjoy enjoy your lives, even though there may not be this absolute, you know, treatment where it's just over. Um, awesome. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna extend a question to both of you uh, that really deals with the pandemic and how it impacted your OCD. And then I'm gonna go to the experts and I'm gonna ask them what their experience has been from the clinical side of things. But can you share with me your experience? Yeah, um, so that's a great question. Um, I think it really, I'm sure answering this question from both of us will really lead to the idea that everybody's OCD is different. Um, so in regards to myself, um, I actually, the you know, COVID and the difference in just, you know, utilizing a lot of virtual formats and not seeing people in person as often didn't really affect my personal OCD. Um, but as Annie stated before, you know, you kind of ebb and flow and it is a lot of hard work to maintain what your gains have been. Um, and, you know, in all honesty, earlier this year, I struggle with OCD as well as an eating disorder and they kind of feed off of each other, especially when things aren't going well. And even though COVID didn't really affect my OCD, nor did all of this restriction um, in society, um, I did relapse at the beginning of this year and I got pretty sick for a while. Um, so I had to kind of work my way back into my treatment and my exposure response therapy, 
to pull myself out of that and to get myself back to, um, you know, feeling happy and functioning um, and keeping myself safe. That's awesome. Um, one line that I was taught through um, from different therapists and things like that uh, was when you have intrusive thoughts, which are those obsessive thoughts that people have been mentioning in both the video and our discussions, um, that you have to kind of not entertain them. And so for me, that line has been um, me saying, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So for example, one of my big um, obsessive thought thoughts is, um, you know, did I offend somebody? Did I hurt somebody? Did I make their day worse? Like I get really nervous about the way I'm perceived. And I want, you know, I never want to hurt someone, um, hurt someone's feelings or anything. So usually through treatment, you know, I'll say something to someone and in my head I have to say, you know, maybe I offended them, maybe I didn't. And that's been a good way to kind of combat intrusive thoughts. And it's something that I've really clung on to for the past few years. Um, through COVID, one thing that's been very tiring and very hard is that um, with things like illness, and again, um, uh, contamination and illness are not things that I've been previously fixated on, but I think our world's kind of challenging us all to be, whether you have OCD or not this year. Um, but the message of, um, you know, maybe I have this. Well, I don't have any symptoms. It's probably not, you know, I usually, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but then having to answer a checklist every time you go to work that says, but do you actually have these symptoms? Having to answer a checklist when you go to church, having to answer a checklist all the time, you know, are you sure you don't? Are you sure you don't? Sounds a lot like that voice that we've been trying to control for a lot of years. Um, so personally, that's been really difficult for me, as well as the disruption of a schedule and any sort of predictability. Um, but that's more anxiety in general and less obsessive compulsive disorder specifically. Cool. Um, to in here, and uh, uh, I'm going to ask the same question is to them is that what has been their experience in regard to uh, in regard to seeing more patients? With, the, with this disorder during the pandemic, actually, I'm actually, gonna I'm going to leave this leave the screen, leave the screen and, 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 and and have Brenda and uh, and uh, Elizabeth and Nick on the screen. I think it, uh, broadly, what we're seeing um, is just an overall increase in stress in for people who maybe were kind of on the cusp of experiencing a mental illness of some sort before the pandemic. Um, it's really kind of pushed a lot of people over that cusp into uh, mental illness and just struggling broadly. Um, and so we, you know, see across um, providers just a lot more people experiencing depression, experiencing anxiety, experiencing OCD, experiencing suicidal thoughts. Um, it's just been something that's kind of really impacted a lot of people and brought up stress levels. For OCD in particular, probably the, the one that's affected the most is contamination-based OCD um, and just kind of worries about getting sick or spreading an illness because this illness is, you know, more contagious. Um, and, and interestingly, for our treatment, it's about having the patients follow CDC guidelines versus go above and beyond CDC guidelines. So um, for some people, if the guideline is to wash your hands for 20 seconds, they're gonna wash their hands for a full minute. Um, if the guideline is to you know, wear a mask when you can't maintain six foot distance, they're going to wear a mask even if they are you know, just walking outside or uh, mostly private. So it's about kind of like tempering them down in their uh, use of rituals or their, you know, kind of over interpretation of the guidelines. Um, but I think Annie brings up a really good point and honestly not one I thought about before this of like that constant barrage of like, are you sure you don't have this? Are you sure? Well, even if you don't, you know, still be cautious and be, and, you know, be anxious about this. Um, and that's not something I thought of for some of our patients of like just that uncertainty and that doubt that can really creep in with that constant questioning. Yeah, I see a comment here about uh, from an from an individual. It says that uh, we lost a lot of progress with my daughter's uh, OCD treatment with the shutdown. Even though she's continued her therapy, I worry that she's lost uh, the exposure practice of being around um, 
so I think that that uh, she she's in safe home. Um, I worry it's going to be hard for her to re-enter public life, uh, returning to school, being around peers. Uh, and this is really a significant challenge. Uh, you know, and I think it didn't only interrupt the treatment for a patient with OCD, but I know many other patients who suffer from drug abuse, uh, drug use issues, and I don't know there's been some uh, suicide and overdose death increase associated with the fact that these individuals then continue to get their treatments and see their physicians and, you know. So, you know, you want to comment on that, uh, maybe, Nick? Um, I, I think that um, just like, you know, staying at home and being socially distanced and wearing masks uh, is at least for some of us starting to feel like the new norm, um, when, when a time comes, you know, when it's safe again to at least start to begin to resume, you know, life life as we knew it pre pre COVID. Um, it'll be a whole new a new a whole new new uh, for many of us to be able to, you know, feel like we can safely go into crowded stores or even crowded outdoor areas again. And, uh, schools, you know, being an example of that. And so I I think for a lot of young individuals with OCD. Uh, there is going to be, you know, some bumps in the road and probably a bit of a learning curve. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about when Dr. Bailey was describing how many individuals with contamination fear, their symptoms have been exacerbated during this pandemic. Um, I think, I don't know if you've seen this, Dr. Bailey, but we, we've also worked with individuals that, um, I don't want to say the OCD gets better, uh, but be, because of, you know, washing hands frequently and staying distance from other people, the, the OCD manifests less less intensely. And so, you know, by, by virtue of staying home and staying distance and being um, clean more often than not. So I think when um, in the try to resume, you know, it was pre-pandemic, there, there are gonna be some bumps in the road. There's gonna be a little bit of a learning curve. Yeah. Yeah, we're finding that I, just uh, people wearing masks, it just neutralizes the anxiety for a lot of people. Like, oh, I don't really have to worry about touching this doorknob because I know everybody's in their hands or, you know, not breathing on their hands, I guess. So, yeah. And it can be really tough. I think um, I, I always come back to this uh, cartoon drawing that I saw where they had a picture of someone kind of with sunscreen and a hat on an umbrella and they were in a, a thunderstorm, right? And they're like, well, this is usually OCD is telling you, like, you need to do these things because you're in danger. And really, there's not that much danger because there's no sunlight. But we're, we're, it is actually sunny out in that circumstance. So we are doing, there is threat out there. Um, and so, but I can see where it's going to be tough for some people to kind of back off of those recommendations um, when, you know, we're given the, the all good to do that. Yeah. Now that I have you all, the experts, I have a question, which is really a very interesting one, and uh, it has to deal with the treatment of uh, resistant OCD. Uh, you know, could you comment on that? When standard intensive ERP medication, etc., has not led to long-term progress, what factors contribute to this, and how can individuals and their families stay helpful? It's a tough one. It is a tough one, um, and yet it's a question I think I can offer some hope and optimism to. Um, so I'll just kind of repeat the question or restate it. When when somebody has received, you know, what we know to be kind of the frontline gold standard treatments, uh, whether it's exposure and response prevention, uh, there are also some medications that produce comparable effects to exposure and response prevention. So the question is, what what do we do? You know, when somebody has tried those options, um, and it hasn't been beneficial. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is that's that's when a higher level of care uh, might come in beneficial to, to the person who is struggling. What we find, particularly in Dr. Bailey's program that she directs where we're working with adults in residential care for OCD, where we're really essentially doing therapy, I don't wanna say 24 hours a day. Um, yes, people do go to sleep overnight, but it, it is a very intensive you know, therapy from kind of sun up until sun down. Um, but the, the treatment doesn't differ. What, what, what Dr. Bailey is doing for patients in her program is still providing ERP, just at a much higher dosage and a higher intensity level. And so oftentimes when we're working with individuals and their families and they come into treatment saying, I've tried everything and it hasn't worked, 
the response has been, you've, you've probably tried the right things, but just like a medication, maybe the dosage wasn't high enough. Let's, let's try this program and give you a higher dose. Um, secondly, uh, we have had people that have had courses of exposure and response prevention therapy with one clinician and it didn't work and then they try with another and maybe that didn't work. And sometimes, honestly, it's just about finding the right person. Um, you know, sometimes personalities mesh well, sometimes people click and work well together. Sometimes, you know, um, I can't explain this, but the third time is a charm. Um, and, you know, being able to hear the information and really apply it, even though it maybe didn't work the first or second time around, there's something about sticking with it um, that sometimes allows the therapy to really sink in. And the last thing that I would say before I'll turn it over to my colleagues here is that even beyond um, frontline medications and exposure and response prevention therapy, there are alternative treatment options that although they are not studied uh, as much as things like ERP and medications, they do have some promising results associated with them. One particular option that I'm thinking of is actually a psychosurgical option. It's known as deep brain stimulation or DBS. Um, it's not something that's very widely available to people because it is a somewhat invasive procedure. However, um, one can meet criteria to be eligible for DBS, deep brain stimulation, when they have gone through multiple trials uh, of both frontline medications as well as exposure and response prevention therapy and they haven't worked. Um, oftentimes in those so-called treatment refractory cases, uh, deep, ba uh, deep brain stimulation and other similar psychosurgical options can provide somebody kind of the kickstart that they need for the psychotherapy and for the medications to then kick in and start working. Um, to the piece about considering higher levels of cure doses in that process, um, on occasion, um, what individuals might find or through treatment is that um, one ritual might have also been replaced with either another behavior or a thought process that still neutralizes the anxiety. And while the individual may have um, delayed or stopped um, what the original or initial response was, there may be something else in its place. And so I do think that it's really important um, that a professional is helping to assess and evaluate for that, um, because if that is the case, then um, yes, it's it's likely just kind of neutralizing the anxiety. Um, and what we know, again, as we talked about the perpetuation of it um, with ritualizing or accommodation, um, it, it may just be, again, continuing to perpetuate. That's interesting. Well, other people have said, um, so I kind of, I, the treatment resistant phrase, I think is kind of hard because I think of it like Dr. Farrell of kind of dosage resistant. That's how I'd prefer to think about it. Um, because it's not necessarily that the treatment for a lot of people that the treatment isn't working. It just, you need more of it. Um, and kind of to Elizabeth's example too, uh, the reason a higher level of care can be beneficial is because you can see those things and assess for those things, um, you know, kind of neutralizing or substituting in a different ritual for another um, when you are at a higher level of care and you're seeing someone more consistently. Uh, I joke that I don't, I don't know how providers do it because there's just so much to see and I know we see more severe cases but um, I you know they're only seeing you for 50 minutes so I, I get so worried that they're missing something or that something's just being substituted in and um, because OCD is, is tricky um, you know it, it finds a way in it's a weird infection like that for some people. Um, and there are other options. And I, you know, I provide ERP and I, um, my orientation is cognitive behavioral therapy, but if someone is finding that those things aren't helpful, you know, they can look to other orientations to see maybe it's just not a good fit. Um, and I think of it too, sometimes like you just, it is a really tough treatment. Anybody who's gone through it knows that it's, you know, it's, we're asking you to do things that are really hard for most people. We're asking you to be anxious a lot and nobody really likes to have that experience um, and you have to kind of trust the process a little bit because you don't really know how it's going to work out on the other side and we've seen it happen so well for people and they overcome OCD that it, we are really you know fans of it and we're advocating for it um, and if you're just you know kind of not at the place where you're ready to to kind of confront those really huge fears, that's okay. Um, you can always, you know, come back when you are ready, you know, get some information. If you don't feel like you're ready to do that treatment, try other orientations. And if you need to come back, 
um, that's fine too. And there's also other less invasive approaches. So TMS, uh, trans transcranial magnetic stimulation, that is an option for OCD as well. And um, it's not a, a psychosurgery, so that's it can you know be helpful for someone who's going through ERP to to receive that um, as well. My my the experts as well is that uh, I see that the disease happening, and this is my question to to a younger individual, and it begins at a very young age. Uh, judging from the film, judging from from having been a physician and seeing this in, in my practice, but I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist. But however, you know, how, how can, can you see this disease in older individual? Uh, can, can the symptoms begin at an older age than, than that of, a, you know, kids in their three, four, five, six, seven years old? I mean, can you see it in someone who's 25, 26, who has had minimal or very little uh, 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 symptoms to begin with, or maybe have some very mild symptoms that were really not very apparent, and they're just simply now they're in their mid twenties, thirties, and now they have a full blown OCD. Do you see that? It's it's rare for someone to present with OCD for the very first time, having not had symptoms really their entire life, kind of after the age of fifty. That would be really rare. Um, a lot of times, and I think from you know um, Annie and Brooke, they they're saying like. I kind of had these symptoms for a while um, and maybe not both of them. I think Annie said she, she was pretty apparent that she had a while, but, um, or other people were like, it's always kind of been there. I've kind of like had these tendencies my whole life. And then um, a lot of times there's some sort of stressful event, not necessarily a trauma or anything like that, but just like, like a pandemic or <laughs> uh, like, you know, even happy things that happen in their life, like getting married or having a child, um, they can be stressful. And so that kind of that stressful event gets them to the point where they're actually more into the diagnostic range of the severity of the symptoms. And so they're experiencing it for the first time a little bit later in life. Got it. Well, uh, I'm going to turn uh, now to, I'm going to turn now to the, to the audience and I want to thank them for, for joining us. Uh, and, uh, and I really uh, also appreciate the the uh, tremendous expertise uh, from the panels and uh, and uh, and all of you. But before I close, we have a few minutes left. I'd like to take everyone who is on the panel, uh, whether lived experience or a clinician, and just share a few words to those individuals who have OCD and 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 just deliver a message before we close this event. Uh, let me start out with Brenda. So just a, a message for everybody. Just a message, yes, to the audience, yeah. you know. I guess um, it, I, we're talking about the pandemic and all of that. I would just really want people, if they are struggling, to reach out. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be Rogers, and it doesn't have to be the higher levels of care. It can be really anybody that can provide assistance if they're struggling with OCD or anxiety or depression or anything, really, um, that there's lots of people uh, waiting and willing to help them. Awesome. You know, uh, Elizabeth? My takeaway is just, um, I loved what Annie and um, Brooke were talking about in the sense of hope um, that that there um, can be the other side. You can get unstuck um, and not to, to give up in your pursuits of that, remembering that it's a process. There will be kind of those waves, the ups and the downs, but um, stick through it. Um, it's been amazing just watching how effective um, treatment and care can be for individuals um, and just really continuing to um, stick through it. I know it's a lot of work on the front end, um, but hopefully in the long run, you'll receive those benefits. Awesome. Uh, Nick? My message for anybody who's watching this um, that is that is experiencing OCD themselves would be that um, you're not alone. Um, there are literally millions of people around the planet um, that while maybe none of them can uh, perfectly understand your experience, can at least begin to appreciate the struggles that you're experiencing. And to echo Dr. Bailey's comment, um, good treatment, while it can be difficult to find, uh, is available. Um, seek out clinicians who are trained uh, in using exposure and response prevention therapy, uh, because the odds are that um, you will have a very good and lasting positive outcome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then. Uh, 
kind of a final message of, you know, understanding that wherever you are on your journey, I know sometimes we do feel stuck. And the purpose of tonight is to feel maybe not unstuck by the end of tonight, but a little less stuck. And it's really easy to say, you know, where do I start? You know, how do I even begin to tackle this? But just a message that you're in the right place. And, you know, the first time I watched Unstuck, I was watching a panel saying, you know, what do I do next? And so just knowing that you are taking those steps to get on your way. Hi. Um, so just kind of a final message. Um, you know, I mentioned it before, and I know a couple of people have echoed it too, but really it's just hope. Um, I think that there are definitely times when you are deep in your struggles um, that it seems like there is no opportunity for a better way to live, um, but there is, but it takes a lot of work um, and it definitely takes access to the right resources. So making sure that your treatment provider or treatment team that you're working with um, is adequately trained in how to treat OCD. Um, another thing too is courage. I think it takes a lot of courage to reach out and um, you know start to look into resources such as attending this webinar um, and um, get yourself into the hands of the appropriate people to help you. Um, I wish you the best of luck as I'm sure everybody else on this panel does too um, and hope that you can find um, a better life for you. Thank you all of you. Thank all of the speakers. Thank all of the audience. And please, if you want to know more about what OCD Wisconsin does, go to ocdwisconsin.org. We are on the web, we are on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I thank you so much for being part of our journey today. And I hope you, if I wish you a very good evening and uh, have a good, healthy life. Thank you very much.